All right. I'm very, very grateful and pleased to be joined by Dr. Cronin. Um, Dr. Cronin is the author of this wonderful book, uh, Fragile Victory, The Making and the Unmaking of Liberal Order. Uh, it's a book on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and mind, uh, a topic that I, I try to read a lot about. Um, and yeah, I, I found this book to be uh, the perfect balance of academic on the one hand and also accessible um, on the other hand. Uh, Dr. Cronin, I feel like I feel like oftentimes academics, they write very specific narrow histories. But this book is not that, right? This book is is a broad uh, purview of history. How, how did you think about the scope of the book? Well, just as you've described, really, um, I mean, I had a problem. And in fact, most of my books and articles are about, you know, answering some questions. Uh, and the problem that I confronted in writing the book was how did we get to 2016? That is to say the, the election of Donald Trump and the referendum on Brexit in Britain. Uh, I'd written in the past quite a bit about the United States and Britain, mostly about Britain, but also about the relationship. Uh, and to have the two you know, liberal democracies, the two countries that had, in a sense, created a liberal world order uh, during and after the Second World War, to have those two countries take these dramatic steps in a not liberal direction, uh, in a direction that you know, criticized and broke with the norms of liberal order, uh, at the same time was you know, absolutely fascinating and interesting. Uh, and so I decided one had to go back and look at the attachment of these two countries to liberal order, the nature of the liberal order they created, uh, how it came together, stayed together for so long and then became controversial and ultimately led to these events. I didn't at the time, of course, because it hadn't happened yet, uh, know that Vladimir Putin would invade Ukraine uh, just as the book was about to go to press, uh, delivering a kind of giant punctuation mark to you know, my argument that the liberal order was under threat. And so, as you saw when you read the book, I added this note to readers at the beginning about the relationship between liberal order and the invasion of Ukraine. But the starting point, and to some extent the ending point of the narrative, um, was Brexit, the election of Trump, and then the aftermath of those things. Yeah. And, and from the perspective of reading it, the perspective of living through these times, there's no question that the invasion of Ukraine adds a level of urgency, uh, I think, to the book, to the message of the book, um, as we, you know, the, these, these questions are, are really on, you know, certainly the forefront of my mind and hopefully uh, lots of people's minds as well. I agree. I agree. Um, let's, yeah, let's just take a step back. Um, the, the title has, I, I would say, uh, a potentially pessimistic bend to it. Uh, the making and unmaking of liberal order. Um, I, I mentioned when I when I sort of introduced the book in the very beginning that uh, it has this um, sense of scope that a lot of books I feel uh, written by by great historians um, don't don't have. And sometimes you find books with a sense of scope, but they're not written by historians, and <laughs> they don't feel like uh, they're they're really hitting the mark. Um, so this is a book of scope. It's a book written by, you know, done with, with serious look at history. Um, other books that sort of feel like they're kind of trying to be broad and inclusive and capacious in this way. Often, sometimes, uh, popular books have a very positive bend on history. I think what comes to mind is Stephen Pinker's, you know, the, the better angels of our nature, um, yes. you know, who look at history and say, look how, how, how well things are improving. Is it fair to say that your book, um, takes a different, different view on history? Well, over uh, over my career, I've been among the more positive <laughs> and upbeat of my generation in terms of what I write. Um, but this book is uh, pretty sobering. Uh, the, the 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 history that it reveals, the messages that um, it it sends, uh, are troubling and worrisome. And so, 
I think that the uh, message overall is uh, realistic, um, not completely pessimistic, but uh, it's certainly not as upbeat as other books that I've written and as books that other people write that you have referenced. So, yeah. Now, it's funny you should mention the title. Uh, well, I, I thought a little bit about the first two words, fragile victory, and thought that people could perhaps uh, wonder what victory I'm talking about. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's a great uh, question. Yeah. Which, which might make it seem like I'm taking a more optimistic reading of the last period of time uh, than is warranted. The reason I use those two words together was that there was a sense, and I don't think it was completely uh, mistaken, that liberal order um, was on the march, was winning. Uh, the end of the Cold War and the the, the progress of democracy and uh, globalization during the 1990s and early 2000s was quite substantial. And it really was a kind of victory for the liberal order uh, put in place in the 1940s. Uh, so the victory I'm referring to is sort of the end of the Cold War and the apparent mm. triumph of liberal order in the 1990s, which, of course, has proved to be not so permanent and stable, and it has proved to be very fragile. Um, so that's what I was getting at there, which means that I, I, in my history, in my telling of the story, there are moments of progress and advance and moments of stability, and then periods like the one we're in, in which liberal order is severely challenged. Yeah. So... I want to pick up on this thread. There's a lot of threads I sort of want to pick up on. One one thread I want to pick up on is the fact that I actually assumed that the fragile victory was World War II. Um, <laughs> but we, we, let's come back to that in a minute. Um, sure. Let's take a step back again. Um, what is the liberal order? You know, why should we care about liberalism? Um, especially now, you know, it, it's, it's something that I think I took for granted, but now I think we can't take it for granted. So, so what exactly is it? What does it contain? Um, and why does it matter? Well, it seems to me that a liberal order is uh, one in which there are, you know, rules of the game, and the international system is rules based and uh, oriented toward maintaining peaceful relations between countries. Uh, it's also uh, a liberal order is relatively open economically. It's not uh, a case of rival empires and protected economic zones reaching a kind of um, equilibrium, uh, but rather it, it, it's a, it should encourage and did encourage uh, open, tr relatively open trade. Uh, and whether it's intrinsic or just accidental, liberal order has been, you know, associated with the promotion of liberal democracy. Uh, not that everything that, uh, you know, countries like Britain or the United States did was liberal, <laughs> or not as if they didn't support a lot of illiberal regimes and pretty nasty characters uh, and practices during the Cold War as part of the Cold War. Um, but you know, the, I think the Catholics talk about a preferential option for the poor. Uh, I think liberal order has a preferential option for liberal democracy, even if it's not realized in practice. And even if democracy in many places, many times, uh, is partial and flawed. It's still the sort of direction of change, I think. Mm -hmm. Is it is it possible to sort of think about liberalism on the international stage as sort of being an openness and, and a freedom of trade between countries and liberalism 
on the domestic stage as being about like a, having a vibrant functioning democracy? Is that, is that sort of a helpful? Uh, That's quite reasonable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I do think that, you know, liberalism at home and liberalism abroad um, sort of reinforced each other uh, for, you know, must much of the time, much of the era since 1945. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things the book did, in addition to, to to teaching me history, which it certainly did do, is it put pieces together, you know, in ways that is important. So, so as I was going through the history, um, one of the questions that sort of you know came up when when learning about this uh, questions related to um, the development uh, and undermining of the social safety net in America and and Great Britain, say, you know, during the Reagan Thatcher mm-hmm. era, you know, questions of battles over workers' rights and unions. Um, to what extent do you see that as being part of the story of liberalism? And to what extent is that sort of a separate a separate issue, independent of liberalism? I think it's quite connected. It's quite central to the story. One of the uh, questions that I felt the need to deal with was how did liberal order... Um, Obviously, in the United States and Britain, but also in Europe, Japan, you know, those parts of the world that were part of a central part of liberal order and stable liberal democracies. How did they get established and how did that, uh, how did they stay stable for, you know, a long time from the 40s up until into the 1970s, at least, and to some extent above beyond? But I'm particularly interested in that sort of quarter century or 30 years, they they trong glorieuse, as the French say, 30 glorious years, uh, after the Second World War. Uh, And that was a period when democracy gets consolidated in places like Italy, which had been ruled by fascists, Germany, Japan, uh, and even places where democracy was kind of threatened, uh, like France, uh, which you know fell to the Nazis, but then had a collaborationist regime during the war. The way in which democracy was stabilized, I believe, mm. after the war, was that it was po- it it, it, econ- it grew economically, it prospered, and. The model that allowed it to prosper has sometimes been talked about as the social democratic compromise, other times as the Keynesian solution or compromise. Other other times people talk about it as the welfare state. People more economically minded have talked about Fordism and they all sort of describe the same phenomenon, which is that capitalism after the Second World War was very different than capitalism in the 20s and 30s. There was a bigger, more active state helping to manage the economy. Uh, There were greater social protections, the welfare state. Uh, There were higher taxes. Uh, There were stronger unions. And all of those things helped to make this world more prosperous. They provided a different, what I call structure of demand. There was more demand in the economy from ordinary people because resources were distributed more equitably. Uh, the relationship between rich and poor, um, you know, the differences between rich and poor narrowed and were much narrower between say 1945 and 1975 than they had been in the 20s and 30s, wherever capitalism existed, uh, and obviously um, much narrower than they are today, when we've had policies since the 1980s um, that are characterized as neoliberal and that have weakened the safety net, weakened unions, and produced rising inequality across most of the developed capitalist world. Not equally everywhere, but um, certainly in Britain and the United States, I think in much of Europe as well. Yeah, I think I think it's really important um, to sort of yeah think about, explore, understand that relationship between uh, liberal outcomes and uh, you know the economic well-being. Yeah, as you mm-hmm. described just just now. I guess one of the again another thing that comes to mind 
when when thinking about this history is sort of what would it mean to defend um to make the case for to to fully understand and embody the illiberal perspective you know the perspective of um the germans in uh the lead up uh, to to hitler and in, 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 you know in the time when when fascism uh, took root in, in in europe um and uh now that to embody to defend to uh, understand to empathize with the perspective of people um you know who are the trump's you know base and most um uh the least uh enthusiastic or, or supportive of our you know democratic norms um for example um you know is there is there is that is there a rational perspective there that says that you know our current system just isn't working you know there is there a perspective that says uh as as in germany at the time uh the economy is so bad um that this this alternative to democracy uh, is is really can offer us a better, at least in the short term, uh, opportunity. I think so. Yes, uh, there are rational grounds for criticizing liberal order. Uh, I think the grounds for criticizing liberal order or whatever the order of the nineteen twenties and thirties would should be called, uh, those grounds were stronger. In that, you know, uh, the uh, Great Depression was genuinely catastrophic, yeah. and the uh, parties of the left and the center uh, had virtually nothing to offer, and so the economic situation was more dire, and could make the critique of democracy you know, um, more plausible. It was also the case that uh, Germany in particular had a host of grievances from the end of the First World War, which, you know, may have been real or imagined, cultivated, orchestrated, or or genuine. Uh, but there were notions that Germany had been, you know, treated very poorly coming out of the uh, First World War. Uh, and Germany, I mean, Italy and Japan had comparable grievances. So there were, so the case against democracy uh, and against liberalism in the 1930s would have been stronger. Mm. I think. It would have been pretty compelling, uh, not necessarily convincing, but compelling. Uh, and part of that is part of that fact um, is reflected in the the, the the later fact that almost everybody rebuilding the world after 1940 or 45 understood they needed you know to create a different kind of democracy that had more social protections that was more prosperous uh, that had a greater role for unions so they designed a capitalism that was the it was quite different from the capitalism that and democracy that Hitler and Mussolini uh, and the Japanese uh, right-wing leaders sought to destroy and, and replace. I think the, the case now for illiberalism, you should call it that, uh, is not entirely different, but it's it's made up of slightly different components, I think. Uh, one, I mean, the United States, for example, uh, where Trump won, didn't lose a war and wasn't mistreated after a war. Uh, in fact, the opposite is the case. Uh, the United States emerged from the long contest we call the Cold War, strengthened and more or less victorious. So... The, 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 so a kind of sense of American grievance toward the world or other great powers is sort of devoid of any any rational basis. Uh, and in certain ways, I think you could say that Brexit was similarly not a very rational uh, thing. I mean, there was no sense in which Europe, the European Union, was actually, you know, doing harm to Britain. I mean, you could make a case that certain regulations that the EU promulgated were excessive or petty, uh, or that some European court rulings you know, were not to your liking. Um, 
So there are legitimate complaints that people in Britain, Brexiteers, may have had toward that world, that you know, world of Europe that they had decided to join. But nothing comparable to the kinds of grievances that Mussolini and Hitler played upon. Um, I think a key factor in the growth of illiberalism in recent years in Western countries, including the United States and Britain, was actually, in a surprising way, the end of the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, right-wing politicians, conservatives, had less of a reason to work creatively with the political center. They could indulge nationalistic or right-wing fantasies um, more easily uh, because they didn't have to pretend to be reformers. They weren't, I mean, uh, you know, the United States locked in a contest with the Soviet Union you know, had a lot of incentives to, you know, appear democratic and liberal and to have a good safety net and so on. If you're not competing with this um, other superpower, um, who do you have to, you know, please? So conservatives were kind of cut free from the center um, by the Cold War. The other thing that happened to conservatives is that they became gripped in the 1980s by neoliberalism, by a, a, you know extreme attachment to markets. And Reagan and Thatcher were the pioneers in this market fundamentalism that, you know, to, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, affected almost all countries in the West. And I think one of the features of what we'll call neoliberalism uh, is that it doesn't have much to offer to ordinary people, to voters, to consumers. Uh, it was a credo that worked pretty well in the 1980s when voters felt and saw, you know, an economic system that was out of control. In particular, inflation was out of control. In addition, unemployment began to grow. The economic model that had worked so well for the quarter century after the war had begun to falter in the 1970s. And it didn't seem as though liberals, people on the left or center left, uh, had a solution to that. So uh, Reagan and Thatcher could offer a turn to the market, cutting taxes and so on, as policies that would effectively uh, cope with the economic crisis of the late 70s, early 80s. Once that had been done, however, as once inflation came back down by the 1980s, by the late 1980s, and once the economy began to grow again, if not as robustly as, you know, 30 years prior, at least, you know, grow somewhat. Uh, what that meant was that market-oriented policies um, became mostly associated with lower taxes for the rich and austerity for the poor or for ordinary folks. And those policies, um, tax cuts and austerity, are not popular. They don't win votes. Uh, and so you, you, you see conservatives in Britain, the United States and elsewhere, you know, having to try other kinds of political appeals. And I think the other kinds of political appeals that they have um, begun to adopt increasingly to utilize and maybe even to believe uh, have to do with pursuing culture wars. There's this interesting sort of symbiosis between, you know, if your economic policies, your social policies, which you're offering to voters are, are not very appealing, you have to get them to vote for you on another basis by claiming that their world is threatened by liberals, by secularism, by, you know, gay rights, and by the rights of, you know, uh, transgendered people. Uh, 
you have to tell them that their Christian Christianity is threatening, that you know, there's a war on Christmas. I mean, and you have to use things like abortion. Uh, so I think the waning attraction of neoliberalism and the freeing up of conservatives to pursue, you know, nationalist, anti-immigrant and culture wars policies, in part because of the ending of the Cold War, uh, create a new dynamic in which, you know, we have the rise of populism and illiberal populism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if another piece here is just the, the way in which it seems that we're we're not wired as human beings at the way we've evolved to be liberal. Um, it seems like we we have instincts towards a zero sum understanding of our country and our borders. You know, we have instincts um, that you know you talk about the culture war as a way to mobilize a certain kind of voter, get them to the polls. Um, the the I think the the deep. Uh, story behind that, the culture war, is that uh, democracy means sharing in a way that people don't want to share. You know, democracy means that I might be very religious and I might see, a, you know, gay people holding hands and or marching in a parade, you know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. Sharing public spaces, sharing what's on in the media. Um, and I think there's a sense in which by nature, we 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 tend to not want to share. And um, there just might be sort of this instinct that we have towards, you know, being fearful of, of foreigners, being exclusionary to immigrants um, and, and, and among religious people to resist, uh, to, to, to push back against um, demographic changes that threaten, let's say, a liberal majority, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as a historian, <laughs> I, I feel sort of professionally um, obliged to argue that um, human nature <laughs> isn't what causes things, but historical circumstances. But I think you're also right in some fundamental level that um, people are not, you know, born liberals, they're not born open and tolerant. They, they are certainly on occasion, um, revert to much nastier impulses of behavior. Um, I just think all of our behaviors are so socially conditioned uh, that it, it that it's hard to uh, to attribute them simply to human nature, you know, reverting to its essence. Um, and I think uh, I some of the recent history, around, say, the culture wars, uh, certainly suggests strongly that the, to the extent people buy into the culture wars, it's, it's not entirely spontaneous. I mean, they get and have gotten fed a diet of exaggeration and fear um, from politicians and uh, opportunistic politicians, um, demagogues, and you know certain uh, sections of the media. You know? I mean, they're they're it's it's really an, another sort of thing that I've learned is, you know, very little is actually spontaneous. Yeah. In the world. And there's somebody who can benefit from it and helps to create it, push it along and so on. And I certainly think in the United States, you can point to a huge industry of people who are committed to waging culture wars. Yeah, I, I, of course, agree. And I I just, from my perspective, I feel like it, it definitely has to go both ways. You know, you have these sellers, these purveyors of misinformation, of conspiratorial thinking, of illiberal, you know, of uh, culture war, mm -hmm. um, attack on Christmas stuff, but you also have buyers, you know? And yeah. so it's, it's you know, there seems to be this, yeah. Um, but I but I, I appreciate that uh, pushback that you gave. Um, in, in your book, part of this story <clears throat> And, and we see it around us today, 
is this uh, alliance in America between a, a conservatism, which is economically motivated, which is a corporate conservatism, which is interested in lower tax cuts, um, and then a, a conservatism, which is motivated by, you might, you might say, culture war stuff. Um, in the Nixon uh, coalition, it was, you know, around racial things um, in America at the time. Um, and uh, a deeply Christian uh, fundamentalist, uh, evangelical uh, movement, anti-abortion. And this alliance seems very arbitrary. Um, it doesn't seem, because of course, you know, in, in, in the corporate uh, economic world, uh, political world, um, you, you wouldn't ex expect to find that uh, so closely aligned with like the anti-abortion, um, you know, uh, religious fundamentalism. So, and so your book sort of tells the story, but but how do you think about that, um, that story, the evolution of that story? And is there, is there maybe like precedent for that um, going back uh, in history? Well, that's a good question. Uh, toward the end of my book, I, I cite another book, uh, it's called Let Them Eat Tweets, and it's uh, by two political scientists who uh, talk about this contradiction between uh, basically a, a plutocratic pro-rich conservatism and a more populist conservatism. Uh, and they cite another historian, actually a political scientist, but he does historical work, uh, a man named Dan Ziblatt, who um, has also written a book on how democracies die. Uh, and he has written yet another book, or a previous book, um, in which he talked about how modern conservatism throughout the 20th century has always had this problem in that, you know, it's program is to protect the rich and the powerful and those who have privilege. And yet in order to win elections in democracies, it needs to appeal to people who are not rich and powerful. Uh, and so how does it do that? Well, it regularly reverts to nationalism, racism, uh, what you would perhaps, we would both call the baser in instincts of our nature uh, in order to get votes. And I think that in a, in a certain sense, uh, the current moment is one in which um, that tendency, that you know, that that fact, that set of facts, um, is very evident. Uh, so I think you're right, and I think you're also right in the sense that uh, business may like lower taxes, but they also have to sell their products to a mass market. And so they, they're, they're, they're pretty agnostic about, you know, their own views that, you know, they can, they can support, you know, very progressive multicultural themes uh, if it suits them and they can promote conservative themes. Uh, but most recently, of course, um, the big business in a way, has not been fundamental to the populism of, say, Trump and of Brexit. You know, in the run-up to the Brexit referendum, the um, uh, what people in Britain call the uh, city of London, the financial interests, um, they were resolutely opposed. And the representative of big business called the Confederation of British Industry Industries um, was also opposed. Uh, and it prompted Boris Johnson at one point to say, fuck business. So, yeah. you know, um, and we have now uh, in the U.S. people like you know, the governor of Florida waging war on woke business. And yeah. we also have business groups like the Club for Growth, which is very much, you know, pro-business, low tax, low regulation, minimal regulation. Uh you know, deciding right now, this this past week, that they don't want to support Trump for re-election. They want anybody else. Uh, that that's partly just you know they think someone else could have a better chance to win, uh, but they're not spontaneously allied. At the same time, in order to win, you know, groups that want to defend the rich have to find votes, and they find them routinely. 
um, among people who are most easily motivated by the culture wars, by race, by anti-immigration politics, by resentment of Muslims, whatever it is, uh, by issues like abortion. Uh, so it's a recurring phenomenon that, you know, wealthy elites interested in protecting their wealth will reach out on occasion when they need it to groups with whom they don't necessarily sympathize um, and who have who are motivated by values and policies that the rich are agnostic about. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's an alliance, but it's a kind of unstable alliance. And yes, certainly an alliance yeah, of convenience. <laughs> and there's an element of I think you know either side, uh, like you know, you you know, using the expediency of the alliance to promote their aims, but uh, a, a hope and a, an assumption that you can sort of keep um you know that, that the corporate plutocratic side can keep the religious zealotry under control. Um, and hope it doesn't you know the cat doesn't sort of <laughs> come out of the they bag hope. at some point. <laughs> they hope. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, changing the subject a little bit. Uh, when I read the book, you know, I think and history starts. The story starts uh, after World War One, if I remember correctly, and you know, leading into World War Two. There, there was a sense in my mind in the way in which World War Two changed everything. Um, that I think I think you know a lot of what we think about in terms of what liberalism is and why it's important, and why someone like me, you know, grew up taking it for granted. Um, you know, certainly my Jewish heritage, uh, also playing part of my understanding in, in, in World War II and the Holocaust, um, is, is sort of born out of that history. Um, and yeah, the way in which the, the, the world was made in a certain way, a liberal order was created to some extent um, after World War II. Um, if it's okay, as it's an experiment, we'll see how this goes. Um, can, I, can I read a little bit of uh, from the book um, describing... Uh, a radio address by Charles Lindbergh in 1939. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then and then maybe you can reflect on why and why this is in the book and, and sort of what it represented about America at the time, um, you know, debating uh, what its role will be in in World War II and sort of what you know his his address says about the public public opinion at the time. So he says, "quote We should never enter a war unless it is absolutely essential to the welfare of our nation." Um, the present war was not. Uh, rather, uh, this is this is sort of uh, interjecting what Charles Lindbergh is sort of, sort of saying, giving more context to his address, saying that according to Charles Lindbergh, the fault lay with the victors in the last war. As Lindbergh explained, quote, the Treaty of Versailles either had to be revised as time passed or England and France to be successful, had to keep Germany weak by force. Neither course was followed. Continuing, Lindbergh pr proceeded to proclaim his commitment to a strong defense. The United States should only fight when our civilization is defending itself against some Asiatic intruder. The current war was not a question of banding together to defend the white race against foreign invasion, but simply one of those age-old quarrels among like peoples and races. He ended by warning of propaganda pushing America to war, urged his listeners to be wary of its origins. We must learn to look behind every article we read and every speech we hear we must not only inquire about the writer and the speaker, about his personal interests and his nationality, but we must ask who owns and who influences the newspaper, the news picture, and the radio station. End quote. And so there's a lot going on there. It's a very complex message. It's uh, he yes. has a few different threads. Can you help us, like, sort of tease apart, you know, that these different these different ideas? Well, uh, it's a fascinating passage or set of passages from Lindbergh, because he, he starts out saying something that seems like common sense to people. We should only, you know, fight when we have to. And I do support a strong defense, but only when we have to. But then as he proceeds uh, to say, you know, when we have to and when we don't, he essentially says that uh, this, uh, this war, uh, that we're confronting uh, doesn't threaten us because it doesn't threaten the white race <laughs> and our race. And in fact, it may threaten the Jews who, you know, in a classic anti-Semitic trope, you know, own the newspapers and the media and push us toward involvement in 
Europe, which is all about protecting Jews. And, uh, and of course, you know, white is white. It's not black. It's not, and it's in that usage, not Asian. Uh, so he starts with what seems like a reasonable case for what people called at the time and subsequently isolationism uh, or a restrained foreign policy, and then goes on to reveal his real views, um, which are deeply racist, uh, deeply anti-Semitic, and uh, very, very nasty. So uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful uh, bringing together of themes that may sound sensible and uh, ideas that are pretty odious. Yeah, and we forget about that thread of of odiousness. I think in our in our history, um, there was uh, eugenics laws. I think in in America around this time, in some places. Not, not only were the laws in, in in the U.S. like this, but Hitler explicitly praised them. Right. And and now you know I think I think that war and what the fallout of that war what we learned from that war has sort of reent reoriented the modern world in a certain way that we take for granted but at the time was was still in flux you know we were still trying okay. to figure out you know these questions of racial hierarchy and uh, and racism and 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 liberalism um, and I think yeah it sort of reflects that sort of uh, the fact that these questions weren't settled the way they are now at the time well, I think you're quite right and I think. Uh, that is one reason why I included a, a chapter on the Second World War that I believe I titled Knowing Your Enemy. And it was during the th Second World War, in mobilizing for the war, in thinking about it strategically, in thinking about who the enemy was, uh, that a lot of Americans and people throughout the West um, became they had their ideas transformed. They actually became uh, wary of anti-Semitism. They became more anti-racist. They became um, less imperialistic, more supportive of anti-colonialism. Now, you know, these, these moves, these shifts continued after the war, but the Second World War was a real learning experience for, you know, us for Britain and for like-minded people. And some of those lessons that we learned had to be sort of inculcated very rapidly and forcefully in you know Germany and Japan after the war. Um, but but the fact that those two countries suffered absolute defeats meant that they were open to learning about what they'd done wrong and to learning a, a different way of looking at the world. Yeah. And the fact that we didn't, I guess, impose like a, a, a indefinite uh, occupation sort of colonization project on the on the vanquished that we sort of supported, I guess, independence. So that, is that fair to say or not fair to say? Well, it's fair to say. I mean, there are people who would would have wanted the United States to maintain uh, a longer occupation and done more to denazify Germany and to rid Japan of some of the people who were, you know, eventually rehabilitated. Uh, but, you know, clearly one reason why the occupations were brought to a close was because we wanted Germany and Japan as allies in the Cold War. Um, <laughs> but I think you're right. There's, I think a longer occupation um, probably would have been worse in both instances. When when reading the book, it, it seemed to me that also in the aftermath of World War II, there was a construction of what we now think of as this liberal order, which includes these sort of like globalist, uh, you might say, um, to use a very charged word, but uh, international institutions um, it, it committed towards maintaining a world peace, committed towards sort of economic trade and, and cooperation. Um, and is, is that is that is that really um, something that we can uh, point to as sort of coming out of the Second World War? Um, and and to what extent are those the same institutions that I think are uh, often, you know, talked about in sort of politically charged discourse uh, today when we think of globalism? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, those uh, institutions were uh, <clears throat> created um, in the last years of the first the Second World War or in the first years after uh, the institutions 
that mostly govern the world economy even today uh, were talked about as the Bretton Woods institutions. And they were institutions whose creation uh, and whose job and charge and structure were all debated, discussed, and agreed at Bretton Woods in 1944. Uh, and then set up quickly thereafter. <clears throat> the United Nations likewise was conceived and its uh, charter approved um, in 1945 so that it came into existence uh, before the war actually had ended. And so yes, wartime uh, was when a lot of this institution building occurred. It would continue after the war uh, with the something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later led to the World Trade Organization, uh, with something called the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, uh, which led to something that now has become the OECD. Um, anyway, these institutions were built at the end of and in the aftermath of the war, and they continue today. Uh, they, some of them have been modified, changed their names, you know, a few have been added. Uh, but basically, this great wave of creative institution building occurred uh, in the mid-1940s, and it was designed to create a peaceful, more integrated world. And those structures uh, are with us today, even though people occasionally rail about them and label them as part of an internationalist cosmopolitan uh, world and world order that is trying to impose things on us yeah, you know, there's, a, there's, a, and all. yeah. well there's a conspiracy I, I i'm fascinated and I, I i follow closely um conspiracy theories and 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 people writing about conspiracy theories and so you know one of the big conspiracy theories that are very popular in, in trump land you know is um this idea of the great reset um, mm -hmm. This idea that you know uh, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, even even it's so mainstream. This is something that even Jordan Peterson tweets about in you know terms of yeah. Jordan Peterson being this like mainstream, uh, relatively mainstream right winger. Um, this idea that you know uh, the World Economic Forum or, or the World Health Organization are part of this nefarious plot, you know, mm -hmm. to impose a, a communist globalist okay. agenda, you know, um, and it's so it's so nonsensical and it's like so absurd. But I think the, the kernel of uh, sense is that it's it's a railing, it's a rebelling against a kind of liberal order that was, you know, sort of put in place around that time. Absolutely. It is yeah. a rebellion against that order. Yeah. Um, but the fact that, you know, the charges that it makes, you know, are so preposterous right. uh, is a sign that it's not a particularly rational, reasoned critique of liberal order. I mean, we could, we can now, in retrospect, criticize the uh, great vogue for uh, globalization that was around in the 1990s and, and after, and at least think about its negative consequences on, say, employment in the United States and Britain. Uh, I don't think we're going to reverse it, and globalization will, our current level of globalization will mostly persist. Uh, but we can certainly do a better job of uh, making sure that, you know, increasing globalization of trade and economic activity um, is less disruptive to average Americans or average citizens of Britain. Yeah. So, Dr. Cronin, our, our, our time is short, but the last question I just wanted to sort of get a sense from you is what goes into writing a book like this, which is so sprawling and so well researched? And is it different from sort of the other kind of writing projects that you've done or is it sort of a, something that you've you know, done before? Uh, it's not something I've done before exactly, um, but I think as you um, mature as a scholar and as an intellectual, uh, you accumulate a fair amount of knowledge. Uh, and I've been teaching history at the university level since 1976 uh, and writing different things you know, all, all along. This is my seventh book and I've edited three others. So you gain a certain amount of knowledge, and, and that's important. Uh, so this book draws on a lot of my prior work, and honestly, a lot of what I've um, read about and used in my teaching over you know, many years. Uh, as it happened, uh, 
this book was mostly written during COVID. And so uh, I was able to get many, many things from the library, take them with me. Uh, other things I could check out online, but I didn't have um, as much access as normal. Uh, and uh, I didn't have as much interaction with colleagues as normal. Uh, so I was able to focus on this book quite intensely. And I think that helped me to write in a reasonably short time, a book that was on a very topical topic, uh, something quite at, at hand and quite urgent. So I think I felt an urgency to do this book, to finish it, to figure out the answers, to figure out the argument um, that was more focused because of COVID isolation. Hmm. So all these things contributed, um, but this it was a somewhat unique experience, this particular book. That's fascinating. There, there was a lot we didn't get a chance to cover. We didn't get to really, you know, go into depth about, you know, Trump and 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 sort of the history of the Trump's relationship to the Republican Party. Um, we there's, you know, that we didn't talk about uh, the war in Ukraine, the, the, all sorts of uh, areas we could have gone, which we, you know, we didn't, but that's fine. And I would just uh, strongly recommend anyone watching to, you know, definitely um, check out the book. I, I know that it was uh, tremendously helpful for me, um, and so I'm very uh, grateful. Thank you for for sending me a copy and for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it, Dr. Cronin. And thank you for interviewing me.